Now, I don't know about you, but if God came to me and said, hey, um, it, it's, it's going to flood. You, you need to build an ark. I know I would be like, <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Like, how, how do you do that? And then one day, you know, like the floodwaters would have come. And I'd be like, you know, yeah, like 20 years ago, God told me, but like, I just never knew how to do it. I just, I couldn't even imagine that, right? Or, or if he came to me and said, hey, you know, Jared, I need you to uh, take Jericho. Like, I know that they've got these like, like impenetrable walls, like you can't get in, like the walls are so big that they, they have like chariot races on the top. Um, yeah, go take that land. <laughs> like, uh, um, all right, see, how much of a military do we have? Okay, tanks haven't been invented. How do, how do, how do we do this? It's, it would seem overwhelming. Or trying to free your nation with just 300 men, right, with Gideon. And I feel like this, the same thing can happen to us sometimes is, is God will speak something to our lives. He'll put a big vision, whether it's planting a church, being a missionary, raising your family to follow after God, whatever that vision may be, supporting your church, witnessing to your coworkers, making it a mission field, whatever it is that God's speaking to us, it can seem overwhelming. And it's like, what do I do? And then on the other side, we have, you know, it's, it's the first of the year. Does anyone here have New Year's resolutions? All right, raise your hand if you've come up with, don't, don't be shy. Do you, anyone have any? Okay, I see some hands. You're like, ah, right? I remember one year uh, I had an intern. I, I'd left from one youth ministry. I, I was at another, and, and my intern, he came up and was visiting, and it was like a few days after the, the new year, and he's like, you have any New Year's resolutions? And I said, no. He's like, well, why not? I'm like, I could lie to myself any time of the year. Why do I need to wait until January to do it? And that kind of started me on this, on this journey of like, okay, so I can see there's a disconnect from, oh, I, I need to do this and how to actually get it done. And then I would see that in my youth students too. Like I realized from talking to them, they knew most of the answers. They just weren't doing it. Anyone, don't raise your hands for this one, but anyone ever relate to that? You're like, I know. I mean, come on, Paul even had this same experience where he was like, look, I know what to do, but then sometimes I don't. I'm highly paraphrasing here, but like that, that battle between, like we have more head knowledge than sometimes we have righteousness in our life. And it's like, how do we break these things down? And how do we actually accomplish these godly goals and these dreams God's given us? So I want to just kind of go through a few steps of, of what we do here and, and how, how we break it down. And the first thing, um, uh, like the first step is vision and having a focused vision. Because without vision, you don't know, and if it's not focused, you don't know where to go. You don't know when you've gotten there. How do you know if you've hit the result or not? Imagine, you know, if you're at work and they say, hey, go do a good job. They always have that spelled out of what that means, of what is a good job. I'll use a couple examples here. Um, health is a big one, right? It's the beginning of the year, so probably everyone who has New Year's resolutions has some sort of health resolution. I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to get fit. What does that mean? What is healthier? And what, what's healthy to one person is maybe not as much to another person, and, and what maybe one person, if so, someone may want to lose 100 pounds, another person, that would kill them. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to get healthy? And so it's, it's much more powerful when you focus it. So rather than saying, oh, I want to get healthy this year, or I want to lose some weight this year, is, is to have a specific target, right? And that's, that's the very first thing. In fact, we see uh, Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3 tells us, and the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it, for still the vision awaits. It's appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow, but wait for it. It surely will come. It will not delay. There's lots of scriptures about having vision and having and being able to make it plain. And they made monuments all the time to remember the things that God called them to do and remember the things God had done for them. Because we tend to forget. We tend to, our brains are very good at processing like what we need right now. So for example, one, one common resolution is people, I want to make more money right? Everyone typically goes, okay, it's the next year. I want to make more money this year. Well, what does that mean? You want to make more money. Okay, well, here, here's a dollar. Go away. You made more money this year. Would anyone be happy with that? No. If your goal was to make more money and so your boss goes, here's a dollar. Now leave me alone. Well, he, he technically, you've accomplished your goal. You have made more money. You're like, ooh, that's, I don't, that doesn't make me happy. I don't feel fulfilled. January 1st, I got an extra dollar and now I'm done for the year. So what were you wanting? Were you wanting to pay off your car? 
Were you wanting to save an X amount of money to help put your kids through college? Were you wanting to pay off your more? What was it? We need specific goals. And that is the way our mind is designed. And that is why God gives us so many scriptures and tells us, have a vision, make it plain. Because once you have that vision, you know what it is you're going for, then you can go for it. And it's going to help you with a lot of the problems that are going to come up when you're trying to accomplish something big. So the focus on the objective. What is the objective? And then the why. The why is just as important. Why do you want that? If your, I'll go back to the health goal. If your goal to get healthy is, because I should. Yeah, doctor says I should. I need to get my cholesterol down. Uh, you know, my heart's not as young as it used to be. Same, my, um, you know, heart health. I'm older than I, I actually am chronologically. And if I don't do something, um, I'm not, I'm not going to probably make it past my mid-50s. So I should. That's not very motivating. You should. An external source, go do this. Versus having a clear and a strong why of instead of I should get healthier, oh, all my friends are, are doing this thing where they're going to run, eat better this year, so I'm going to do it with them. Like, yeah, I'm going to kind of is going, no, I am determined. I will not let another man walk my daughter down the aisle. Ooh, that's powerful. That, that right there is powerful. So instead of now a doctor telling you, hey, you know what? Your days are numbered if you don't change your lifestyle. You should do this. Eh, yeah, I know I should. Versus that image of, of you not being there and another man walking your daughter down the aisle. That's a powerful why. Or maybe it's like, you know what? I want to be around to see my grandson graduate college. He's going to be the first person in our family to have a college degree. I'm going to be there for that. I'm going to get my, my act together. I'm going to. That's going to make it a lot easier. And that alarm goes off to go to the gym when it's the decision between the cheesecake and the salad, right? Having a why, having that, that and it comes from that vision of when God speaks to you and he gives you uh, something, having that why of what, what is it? Imagining how it's going to impact you, how it's going to impact your family, how it's going to impact those, if it's a God-given thing that God has said to do, what about the people that that's going to reach and the difference it's going to make in their lives and, and to hold on to that. And without that, we can lose sight of it. And it gets much harder when the hard times come. And in fact, I go as far as saying your why will determine your level of success. I'll say that again. Your why will determine your level of success. Or you can take it further and can say if you'll have success or not. Because if it's just something you're supposed to do, you're probably not going to do it. But if you have a strong, powerful why behind a clear, focused vision, you're much more likely to actually ha accomplish it. Um, and the second thing, or, or the last thing there with, with, with having vision is imagine. You got to imagine it. What is it going to be like when you accomplish it. And you kind of role play here. You think of it like, right? So let's, let's go back to the church planner example. Um, oh, if God, God calls you to plant a church, well, that can seem big. That can seem overwhelming. And that can seem like, how would I ever do that? Well, if you start to break it down and you start to imagine having this church, you start to imagine the people you're going to be reaching, right? Or let's make it, make it a little closer to home. Same concept, but now it's reach, start witnessing to your coworkers, oh man, what, how do I do that? That seems intimidating. What if they don't like? But you start to imagine leading your coworkers, leading Sam to the Lord, leading Linda to the Lord, leading, and you start to think of them and you see their face and you see their kids and you see the difference that it makes in their lives. You see that their family, the entire family getting saved. And you have that, that mental picture that, and you imagine that, that is going to, it's, it's like rocket fuel to your goals. When you can see it, the outcome, you get excited about it. And if you think about it, that's, that's what we all do with, with some of these other ones, like with the health and, and the, the finances, right? We imagine that big bank account, or what, oh, what is it gonna be like when I can drive that car, or oh, what's it gonna look like, oh, in the summer, when I'm, I, you know, I'm, I've got that beach body I was wanting, or whatever it is, right? And so we, we can do that partially anyways, but how important it is to be able to have that strong vision. In fact, there's, there's a really good tool for this to help you imagine it called vision boards. So some of you probably, if we surveyed the room, some of you probably like, yeah, I know what that is. I've got one. And others are like, oh, a what? A what board? A vision board? And essentially what a vision board is, is where you literally make a picture of your goals. So you take out like, okay, now again, this all follows the vision part. So this is after you've prayed. You're not just picking things out of the sky. You're like, okay, a million dollars and 
a driver Ferrari and have a mansion, right? After you've spent time praying, and that's why we have Thanksgiving. You're thankful for the, the past year. And then we have Christmas and we think about what the gift Christ gave to us. And we start reflecting and thinking. And, and then God begins to speak to us, like, hey, this is what I want you to do this year. And Jonathan, you know, talked about it, of looking back of the things that God was able to accomplish in your last year and what he has for you this year. And then you begin to put those down and just like in Habakkuk where it says to write it down on a tablet and make it plain. That's essentially what a vision board is, is you take something, you typically, you know, print off pictures, cut them out of a magazine, whatever, there's different methods, and you make a vision board of this is a visual representation of what God is calling me to this year. And it, and it gets specific and you have it there and you can see it. This is something that Jonathan and I both practice, and this is something I can tell you my before doing vision boards and after vision boards, huge difference. Because what happens is it, it keeps you on track. It keeps you from kind of getting off, and you're like, oh, I was supposed to be doing that. And have you guys ever made goals and then gotten to the end of the year? You have your, your New Year's resolution, resolutions, you get to the end of the year, and then you look at them again, and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot I was going to do that. Well, it's... It's like December now, and it's, it's a little too late now, but that was a really good one. Man, I wish I had done that. What a, how, how different would my life have been? And so essentially, it's this idea of taking these things you would have done anyways, but now you're doing it ahead of time with excitement instead of afterwards with regret. So vision boards are a very powerful tool. You can look them up. There's, there's great resources on it. Um, John then likes to actually print his out. He puts them everywhere. I keep mine on the lock screen of my phone because statistically speaking, like I'm going to look at my phone far more times than... I am going to my mirror or refrigerator or anything like that. So every time I see it, it's my, it's my, bat, my home screen, my phone, and I'll make sure I look at that and I, I remember it. I'm like, yes, and I remember my why, and I have, my, I have them broken down, and I'm like, okay, i got to stay on target, so keep me focused on this. So it's a, it's a super powerful tool. Um, Joel 2.28 says, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And the Acts 2.17 is uh, basically a recording of that in the New Testament. And the Bible makes it very clear for us to be able to see the things that God has for us, that he will show us things, right? And he, he's going to give us these things that we are then to follow after and pursue. And then there's, there's these tools and these ways to keep track of this stuff, and so that way we're being good stewards of the vision God has placed on our life. Um, second, the next step in accomplishing a goal is to execute. You got to actually do the work. So we can sit around and we can vision and we can plan and we can get all excited of what our lives are going to look like, you know, when we hit this goal. But if you don't actually get up and do anything towards it, it's never going to happen. So once we have our plan and we have the right plan, and again, I'm not spending a lot of time going into it because it's a whole nother message, but it's very important you know, if you want you know, a good godly life full of not just success, but full of fulfillment and joy and peace, this all needs to be based on the plan, like hearing from God, right? Otherwise, we, the world does this without that. So if we're, not, if we're not doing the God part, we're not doing anything better than the world is. We're just accomplishing our own worldly goals that at the end of our life aren't going to get us the result we want. So I'm kind of taking it for granted that we're all on the same page, that this is, we've heard from God, we've sought God, we've, and, and we're not just picking out like a bunch of, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then once we have that, we've gone through that process, we begin to execute, we begin to work. So Luke 14, 28 says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? So a lot of times, I'm going to take a minute here, and, and typically anything when it comes to doctrinal stuff or stuff in the church, you can go way off in the ditch on it either way. And I'm going to spend a second on one way we get off in the ditch on this sometimes, at least the way I grew up and in, in a smaller church and smaller churches, is we would go way off to the left on this and we would over-spiritualize everything. You have to be careful because I'm not trying to say, because you can go the other way, you can humanize things too much and it can be all about your own human effort, but it's not, it's, it's in the middle, right? And God gives us guidelines on how we're supposed to live and, and accomplish things. But we, we would go way off to the other side and we just pray about everything. And then we'd pray about it. And then we'd pray about it. And we'd pray about it. And then we'd pray about it. 10 years later, we're praying about it. 20 years later, we're praying about it. And then finally, I would see people who were 60, 70, 80 years old, and they have these things they've been praying and believing their whole life. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a balance, because there are times where you just have to hold on, and it can take a long time. 
And there are visions God puts on your heart. So there's a discernment here. But there's other times where I feel like we're praying and we're praying and we're praying. And I, I just have this like mental picture of God in heaven. Like, okay, yes, I said yes 10 years ago. Like you need to get up and go. And then I will, I will bless it. It's there. The resources are all there. They're all ready to bless you, all ready to help you. You're still on your knees praying. Get out of the prayer closet and then go. You know, we, we talked about Joshua, you know, and, and the Jericho wall. He still, they still had to march around and they still had to open their mouths and, and, and praise God. They didn't just sit back miles away and pray and pray and pray. And then all of a sudden they heard a rumble as, as the walls fell. They had to take that step of faith. They had to put in that work. They had to go and, and have the faith to walk around and get mocked and then get mocked and then get mocked and then doubt of, or what are we even doing here? No, we're going to hold fast. That's why the vision part is so important. We're going to hold fast to what God said. They put in the work, and on that seventh day, those walls fell. And I think that this is a trap we can get into where we'll, we'll spend so much time in the prayer closet, we don't ever act. And again, on the, we can get on the other side where we humanize everything, and we're doing everything in our own flesh, and we're not turning to God. And I remember being a teenager and kind of in that transition from teenager to adult and I was looking at, you know, getting married and getting my own place to live in. And I'd graduated from high school. And, and I, was, I, I was really struggling with this because I was like, what's the balance? And I, I was really, um, really upset, really frustrated. Like, I can't, I can't get a clear answer. What's the balance on this between, like, I don't want to spend my entire life in the prayer closet, but I also don't want to spend my entire life just never seeking God. How do I know when I need to get on my knees and pray? And how do I know when I need to get up and go and, and take some action? And kind of as an answer to my prayer, through my dad, he had gone on, on a trip to um, David, uh, uh, Paul David, tri- uh, David Young Cho's church, sorry there. Um, he, in, in South Korea, the largest church in the world, and he'd gotten a few books and he brought, one, brought them back and handed me a couple of them. And one was on prayer. And then one was even more, it was specifically on what I was seeking God for. And I'd spent months like, God, I don't understand. Like, when do I do what? Like, am I not praying enough? Am I too humanly here. And the, the entire book talked about it and talked about, and I'll just to sum it up quickly, it basically said, in the beginning you spend, you go to the prayer closet, you, you get alone with God until you hear the answer. It doesn't matter how long it takes. You cry out to God, you seek God. Once he gives you an answer, once you have that vision, you have that focused vision, that's when it's time to get up. And now you, and he's talking about like, some people can fail because they'll spend so much time and they want the answer to every little single thing. It doesn't mean that God's going to say, here's an entire plan on how everything's going to work out. No, once you hear from him to go, that's when you go. You guys ever use GPS for a long trip? I've several times, you know, well, we drove all the way from California out to Virginia, and then several times from Virginia out to either Louisiana or Oklahoma to visit family. And I can tell you, it's a 25-hour trip, 24, 25-hour trip. And I never started that trip out knowing what turn I was going to make eight and a half hours into the trip but I did when I got there. Does that make sense? So sometimes I think that we sit there and God will tell us something and we just keep praying and we keep praying, we keep praying because we can't figure out if we're going to go left or right or what exit to get off of eight and a half hours into that trip. You don't need to know that to get started. All you need to know, in fact, (laughs) what I love about GPS is you don't even have to know what you're really, you just pull your driveway and start driving. And then, you know, because, you know, when you're sitting still, it's really hard to know on the GPS. I, I can never figure that out. Like, is it telling me to left or right? Which way? So I don't even try anymore. I just go, I pull my driveway. I start driving whichever way I would normally go to work, to church. And then I let it reroute me and say, um, no, dummy, you, you were supposed to go that way. Okay, so now you need to turn left. Cool. Now I'm right back on track. And, and, and we don't get held up sometimes if, if we treat it that way, where we say, God's called me to do this thing. I'm going to step out in faith. And when I get to that point where I need to know to go left or to go right, God will be faithful and he will provide. And that really, that goes into the next point of not overthinking it. And that, I think, stops us so many times as we try to overthink every little detail and every little thing. And then as we're doing this, it's like, well, what if I make a wrong turn? Or what if I do something wrong? Or what if here, the idea, is, the next point is there is we evaluate our progress. So if you have a goal and you're working and you've heard from God, and you've, you've had the vision and you're focused on it, you have your why, you're doing all these things, you've got a plan, and then something happens, you ever know, plan never goes exactly according to plan, right? You're like, I have my plan, but my plan didn't say this was going to happen. I wasn't expecting 
for the coronavirus to, to hit and shut things down. I wasn't expecting this loss in the family. I wasn't expecting this health issue. Now what do I do? Well, we evaluate the progress and we make changes accordingly. Um, I think it's really fascinating when I learned about how a torpedo will work, right? And essentially when they, when they fire that torpedo, let's just you know, say a uh, submarine firing at a battleship, when they launch it, it's on course. But as soon as it's launched, within a second, it's now off course. You gotta think there's, there's currents, the, the ship it's firing at is probably not just sitting there, it's probably moving in a direction. So within a second, that torpedo is now completely off course and is gonna miss its target. And so what it does is it has technology in it to, it's constantly checking and saying, am I on target? No, okay, make a slight adjustment, make a quarter of a degree of an adjustment. Boom, am I on target? Yes, okay, am I on target? No, okay, make another adjustment. Okay, am I on target? Yes, okay, check again. No, no, make an adjustment. And it does this all this over a very short period of time. And so essentially, if you wanna think about it, because like, we can be very hard on ourselves, we're like, well, I don't know exactly what to do. Well, torpedoes find their, their target all the time by spending 90% of their time being off target, right? But because they're constantly making those adjustments, when it matters at the end, it hits its target and it gets its desired result. And sometimes I feel like that can get us off track because we, we, we make one little misstep or we don't know, what, we're afraid to make a misstep and, and so we become paralyzed or we beat ourselves up with guilt because of we did make the misstep but God is faithful and he's going to guide our lives. And so we're not perfect. And that's why we follow the plan. But just like that torpedo that has to keep reevaluating, that's why it's so important to have a daily practice of the word. Because we can be getting off. And if you go for three months and you're off track, you can get quite a bit off track. But if every day we're submitting ourselves to his word, we're spending time in prayer, he's speaking to our hearts. We're, we're involved in a fellowship of church. We're coming here and, and we're in the middle of worship and he speaks to us and he's like, hey, that thing. We're like, oh, I'm just trying to listen to Mark sing. This is a great song. This is my favorite song. And he's, God's like, oh, I got to talk to you about this right now. That's a little course adjustment. We're involved in community groups and we're discussing something and we're able to say, well, what about this? This is, a, and we're able to be led and guide and work with each other and, and help. That's a course adjustment. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives. That's why there's so many verses about daily daily pick up your cross, daily renew your mind, daily, daily, daily. You hear scriptures about Jesus getting up in the morning and spending time with the Father. He'd spent all eternity with him in heaven at the, already, outside of time. Like, you, you would think uh, uh, three years of ministry, he could have gone without praying. If anyone could, it would have been Jesus. But he actually got harassed for how much time he spent in prayer. And they would tell him, Jesus, what are you doing praying so much? People are, they need you. They're, they're sick and they're demon possessed and they need healing and they need deliverance and they need forgiveness. What are you doing? He's like, I'm doing the most important thing first. I'm off with my father. I'm praying. You, countless times we'd read examples of him ministering all day. Nothing to eat, nothing, no sleep. It's now time to, time to grab something to eat and get a few hours of sleep before the next day. And he's like, mm, not yet. I got to get alone with, with my father. And making those, and he's, he'd make crazy outlandish statements, right? Like, I don't say anything other than what I hear from my father. I don't do anything other than what my father's told me to do. And it's like, oh, that seems like impossible. He's the son of God. He could do it. No, he did it because he was constantly checking in with his father and was able to make those course corrections. And so you think like, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go in and I'm going to give my boss a piece of my mind. Well, then you have your devotion. You realize, oh, that's probably not a good idea. Instead, I'm going to pray for him. And that's how we get to have these righteous lives where we're able to avoid the mistakes that we would normally make and constantly be course correcting is by spending that time alone with the Father, reading his word in prayer and in worship. And then lastly, step three of how to accomplish the goal is going to be gratitude. Now this one, if you're like me, um, this one might be the hardest of all of them, right? Because it's like, okay, focus, vision, okay, that makes sense. You need to know where you're going and, and whatnot. Execute, that one really speaks to me as like a type, type A, you know, get it done, results-driven guy. That one, I love that one. That's just, this is, can it be step one, execute, step two, execute again? Like, I'd be so much more successful if that's all, all it took, right? But then step three is gratitude. And this is one I have had to learn with lots of, um, lots of pain, lots of tears, <laughs> the hard way is, is gratitude. Because I just want to move on to the next thing, right? But the, 
power of stopping and being thankful. So I looked at, like, there's so many verses on gratitude, praise, thankfulness. It's like hard to even just pick one, but I settled on Psalms 104. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. And that one seemed really powerful. And as I was looking at it, I'm like, okay, like some of you, to be honest, my, typically when I hear that one, I don't really even think of the impact of it. I just think of the song. Anyone else here? They just hear that, like, and they, just, uh-huh, and they start hearing the song, and you totally miss the impact. But when you really look at it, it's like, wait, wait a minute. Like, if you think about what it's actually saying here, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, like, it's a little harder for us to think of being here with the president and the way it has, but you think of a monarchy where there's a king, and they have, he has a court, and that's like a, a, a highly valued place is the king's court. And then to be able to get into the king's court to get before the king to speak to him is a big deal. We know that the entire book of Esther essentially revolves around that as its, uh, its main plot, right, is her getting in front of the king to plead her case. There's, there's power in being able to get into the king's court and plead your case in front of him. But it typically takes a gift. And so it would only be other nobles and other wealthy people who, who even had the, the, the privilege of this. But this is telling us that God... God Almighty, the Most High, that the, the, how we get into his, his courts is not with some expensive gift or being super successful, but it's with, with thanksgiving and with praise. And I just think of all the times in my life that I, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've had, I've, okay, let's be honest. I say prayed, right? But words have power. The meaning of the words and specific words have power. So what I was doing is I was complaining and I was complaining and I was complaining. And then I was like, God's, God's not listening to me. You guys ever feel like you're praying and just God's not hearing you? And there could be multitude of reasons there. But again, I was just complaining. I was like, why is God not listening to me? God, does God not care about me? Does he not love me as much? And it, w- it would be like staying outside of a, of a castle, right? And you're like, I need to talk to the king. I need him to fix this thing for me. You got to get into the court first. You got to be able to speak directly, plead your case to the king. And it says we do that with thanksgiving and praise. And the idea of like, wow, how many times did I slow down my journey and slow down the progress of my God-given vision because I came with all these problems and complaints and stuff first when I should have just come and humbled myself and worshiped and praised God and then presented my case. And it would have done two things. One is that scripturally, it would have ushered me into his, his courts. I would have had a much better, I would have been blocked by all the negativity and it would have caused a state change in me because now when I'm there, I'm not frantic and I'm not panicking. I'm not like, God, you told me to do this and it's not working out and, and this thing and what, what are we gonna do? You said, you said, did I not hear you right? Instead, it's like, we can come and say, God, you called me to do this. I believe that you're going to work it out. Your, your word also says we have not because we ask not. So I'm going to present this to you. I know you already know this, but this, I just want to talk this through with you. Here's the challenge I'm having. What are we going to do about this? How are we going to overcome this? And I, I guarantee you what's going to happen is you're either going to, God's going to speak something to you and you're going to have some divine knowledge that now you're no longer in this frantic panic state of what are we going to do, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? God's going to speak something to you. It's going to be the answer you need. And it's now like, oh, yeah, this is simple. This is all I have to do. Or God's going to intervene on your behalf. And you're not even going to do anything. God's going to go out before you and open up those doors of opportunity. The power of gratitude is so important. So the, the, the first kind of, I want to give some practical ways, especially if you're like me. And you're kind of dense when it comes to this, right? Because I struggled with this for years. When I, when I left I, was, I had a break from youth ministry and I got into um, the, the world of like entrepreneurs and, and I was working for startups and stuff. They all talked about the power of gratitude and it went right over my head. And they talk about gratitude journals and so I'd try it and I'd get a little journal and, okay, um, let's see, what am I thankful for? Okay, well, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my life. I'm thankful for my kids. Um, I'm thankful for my health. Okay, all right, I did it. All right, move on. Okay, where's my to-do list for today? And I struggled with it. And I realized that, you know, there's, there's some steps to it. And so the first one is be thankful for what you already have. So many times we act like kids on Christmas, right? Where you're as a parent, you're all excited. Here you go. Oh, awesome. Next present. Where's my next present? Is that it? I don't, I don't have anything else. 
We just opened 36 presents. What more do you, you know, like, like you didn't even show any gratitude for them. And, and so we, sometimes we, we get caught up in the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Spend some time to just slow down and relax and be thankful for what we already have. And you may be thinking, I don't have anything to be grateful for. If you feel that way, if that's the thought that comes to your mind, come talk to me. I'll, I'll walk you through this. I do this with students all the time. No offense, but students, if, I don't know if there's any in here, uh, they can be very dramatic, right? We as humans can be dramatic, and, and students don't have the life experience to kind of curb that a little bit. And it's really easy for us, for us to be like, I don't have anything to be thankful for. And so I'll have to walk them through it. Okay, well, what about this? Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Well, what about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that. And walk them through it. By the time, by time we're, we're done, they're like, yeah, okay, I didn't. Yeah, you're right. I am quite, I am very blessed. I even, wow, never, never even realized that. My life isn't falling apart like I thought it was. I just have a problem I need to deal with. And now that I've gone through a, a practice of gratitude, I'm calmed down. I guess I can now work on just overcoming this problem. <laughs> What a difference it, it can make. Secondly is, is being thankful for the result. And I learned this from uh, Pastor Ralph Etheridge my, in, in Calvary Assembly in Merced, California, my home church. He came in, I had two, like at my home church, we had two different pastors. And he came in and he was big on praise. And he would talk about praising, like you pray for something and then you, you begin to thank God for it. And that seemed really weird to me. I'm like, what? I, I don't have it yet. He's like, praise God for it anyways. I'm like, but I just, I don't, I don't have it. Like, it hasn't happened yet. Like, wouldn't I praise God and thank God for it after he delivers it? And he's like, and there was, there's so much in this, I can't, I can't unpack it all. But it's like, no, because you're showing your faith. You have faith that once you've heard from God, you know this is going to happen. And you can begin to praise God. And instead of worrying about the result and worrying about why it's not here yet, you begin to praise God for what you know he's going to do. And again, this comes back to we've spent the time in the prayer closet and now we're out. We know we've heard from God. And so once we hear from God, it's as good as done. We don't have to worry, is it going to happen? We can begin to focus on praising God for what we know he's, he's about to do. And then lastly is taking time to actually feel the emotions of gratitude. This one I'm, I'm kind of stressing because back to me struggling with like, okay, I was doing it all mechanically, right? Okay, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for this. And I was writing it down. I'm like, it doesn't work doesn't work. Why is it working for everyone else but, but for me? Well, typically if something works for everyone else but you, or the Bible says to do something and it's not working, you're probably the problem. <laughs> you're probably doing it wrong. And I realized after years of trying this and not trying it, trying it and not trying it, is I was just mechanically writing down things that I thought I should be thankful for. I wasn't actually taking the time to experience the gratitude for them. And it sounds like semantics, but it's a huge shift. And so what I, I, I got to do is like, I, I got better at actually being able to visualize the things I have and really thanking God for them and really being able to really, I can't say it any other, a better way than really feeling it. So instead of just being like, okay, this, okay, I'm thankful for my wife. I, I got to, I pictured our life together. And I think about, you know, we got married young and, and she's been there with me for, for so many years and all the ups and the downs and, and how we've grown together. And I started thinking of specific stories and times that she would help me and, and my first big job I had and how she would help me. And I'd come home and there were certain things I struggled with and she would help me get through them. And, and, and I would think about it. And even, even now I'm, I'm starting to smile and I realized that's when you know you're doing it right. Now, I haven't read this anywhere. This is my own antidotal kind of trigger here is how do you know when you're, you're really doing it right and you're really feeling the, 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 those feelings of gratitude is for me, I, I tend to, I notice when I'm smiling. And so as I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of all those times with my wife and everything, and at first it can maybe seem mechanical and you do it. And I would notice, I'm, oh, now I, I, got a, I got a big old silly grin on my face. I know like, okay, I've hit it, right? Okay, now let me think about my kids. And I start thinking about everything and you're going through the memories. And then I notice like, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here as I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling and I'm like, Okay, I've got it. And, and it took me time to really slow down because this was hard because I just wanted to get to my to-do list. Anyone here, type A, who can, who can imagine like the idea of spending time every morning just focusing on your feelings and what you're grateful for and things that you already have seems like a waste of time. I could have gotten the, the first thing on my list done. But it's so important. And having it as a daily practice, as, as the worship team comes back up, 
having that as a daily practice, and this was so hard for me to focus on, is because it was like, I got things to do. I want to start the day off right. It took me forever to realize this is how you start off right. And so having that time alone with God, having that, that thankfulness when you're reading, even, even changes your, your scripture reading. As you're reading something and, and you read the scripture and we can just go on, but when you actually take the time to stop and think about it and you're like, what is the impact of that? And you're like, wow, thank you, God. And, and, and you just begin to think of like, wow, what does that, that mean in my life? And you take that scripture and, and you play it out. Like, what, because he did this, that means I have this, and that means I can go to him for this. And, and you begin to really dwell on it, and you become so much more grateful. And then now you go to start your day when you've had that time with the Lord, and you're feeling so thankful for everything God has done for you, and you've got everything in perspective. And now you go out, and, and you're like, okay, so let's take a look now. What, what is my, my vision, and what is it that God's called me to do? You're in such a better state now to be able to carry it out. And when problems do come up, they're not nearly as effective because you've, you, you've got a clear vision, right? So the problems can't distract you from it because you know, well, this is where I'm going. So even if I have to veer off and I have to course correct, I know where I'm going. I know why I'm going there. I, I know that I need to put in the work and I know when I need to stop and take things to the Lord and I know when I need to get up and, and keep walking and, and, and moving forward. And lastly, I have a grounding in, in, in gratitude and I, I'm so thankful for what he's done for me. And so when the, those anxiety comes or that, that stress comes and you want to have a pity party and you want to just quit and give up or, you know, as we've got a famous story in the Bible of just wanting to lay down and die and just saying, God, I'm the only one left. Just take my life. We're able to stop and focus on what God has done for us. All those common ways that will derail us either go away or become so small they're easy just to step over. And then we find ourselves, as we're, we go through this process and we take the time to invest in actually doing these things the right way and, then, and we begin to hear from God and we're accomplishing that and then the joy that comes up in our life and the fulfillment that we have and then we're able to help others and then blessing upon blessing. That's why, you know, the Bible talks about for, you know, everyone who has, even more will be given. And it kind of seems like, wait, what does that mean? And as, as we're going through this process and, and God's able to trust us with more and more and more. So I want to encourage you as we look at this new year, don't just make New Year's resolutions because like I said, we all, we all know what that means. Those are just ways we lie to ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Essentially, we're excusing our, our current bad behavior because we're going to procrastinate and do good behavior later, right? How many of you have ever like, I'm going to eat whatever I want from Thanksgiving to Christmas because I'm going to make a resolution to go to the gym in January? So rather than doing that and just throwing these things on the wall and hoping they stick, this process of spending the time every morning in our word and going over and seeking. If you don't have, you say, Pastor Ed, I don't feel like God has, I don't have any kind of vision. I don't have any goals. I kind of feel like I'm drifting in life. Then you start at step one, vision. Well, I just said I don't have vision. Seek God. Seek him and you will find him. Begin to pray. If you're young, relax. You're young. You don't, you're not gonna have some vision for changing the world maybe yet. Give it a few years. Maybe you got to grow in God. Spend this time to grow. If you're older and you're like, I, I just kind of thought I was done. I've raised my kids. I've, I went to work. I served the church. You're not done if you're still here. What else does God have for you? And we're gonna find that by seeking him. So if you remember nothing else, you're like, oh my goodness, that was so many steps. There were so many pieces in there. I'm not gonna remember any of it. Then just remember the one thing. The one thing that I always want everyone to remember when I get off the stage, just get up tomorrow and seek God. That's the most important thing. And that is going to be the driving force in our life. If we can begin to seek God and we will hear from him and be able to, because all this stuff, everything I just talked about today, you're like, oh, so many steps. It's all here in the word. I just organized it in a way to make it easy steps, right? So we can put it on the screen and it's easy to remember, but you're gonna get those same principles in here. If you spend the time and you hear from him. So as you stand and as we sing this last song, I just wanna encourage you all 
If nothing else, if you're sitting here and you're like, everything's going wrong in my life. I don't have any kind of direction. I don't have any kind of vision. I can't even understand what I'm reading when I read the Bible. Remember that gratitude part. So we got this next song. Begin to just worship God. Begin to let everything else go. And begin to just say, God, no matter what, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. And by your grace, I'm going to get to where you need me to go. So let's spend this time to worship God.